Okay, how is this now? That dying robot was brought to you by Jose's microphone. Hi, and welcome to the sixth episode of the Clive Barker podcast. With us today, doing the hosting duties, we've got Jose Leitao. Hi. And I'm Ryan Danhauser. And today we've got a special guest. Yeah, indeed. We have a special guest. You might uh, recognize him as the uh, Butterball Cenobite from Hellraiser. Um, also as Onaka from Nightbreed, and uh, he was also in The Book of Blood as Derek, and he will also be appearing in a few upcoming movies like The Dead of Night and uh, The Fourth Reich, uh, besides Doug Bradley, Sean Pertwee, and Tom Savini. Um, we have with us theater train and movie actor Simon Bamford. Hello and welcome to the podcast, and thanks for being with us tonight, Simon. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great. It's great to be here. I was thinking you wouldn't recognize me from my voice from the Butterball character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, he, he, did uh, originally, he did originally have some dialogue, actually, when, when the original scripts came out. But when, oh, they, really? when, when they started putting the, the makeup and their heads on and we got to the scenes where I had to talk, um, they realized that um, I couldn't. <laughs> I, I had false dentures glued on top of my own teeth. And... Um, all, all the lines I had were plosives, so there were P's and B's. Um, perhaps we prefer you, impossible. And you can't say those if you can't put your lips together. You can't say P's or B's. So I know how are you? <laughs> which, which, so your lines ended up going to the female Cenobite. They did indeed. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very depressing day for me on set. I tell you. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine. All right. Well, um, well, thanks again for, for taking the time to do this interview. Uh, we like to start off, if we could, uh, with a quick summary of your career and ask you a few questions as we go along. Sure. Um, so you got into theater at an early age, right? Uh, high school plays and such? That's right. Um, Actually, uh, even before then, my primary school teacher, um, so kind of kindergarten teacher, uh, was very into theater. And so I, I started doing some work there and then um, went on, did some more in senior school um, uh, and kind of local amateur dramatics. Um, but I always kind of, I always realized it was what I wanted to do um, and wanted to go to drama school. But my, my, my folks wouldn't let me until I kind of got to a certain age and got some, 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 some qualifications, which was very wise of them. Uh, yeah, it wasn't until I was 17, 18, I went to uh, Mountview Theatre School in London, which to, to, to properly train. Um, spent three years there. Um, whilst there, we did a, we had a, quite a good time. Actually, we were doing Oh, What a Lovely War, a production of Oh, What a Lovely War. And we toured it to the States. We went to Dayton in Ohio um, oh, wow. during, during the Falklands War. So it was, it was kind of perfect timing, really. And we were very... Uh, it was a very popular production. I don't know if you know what oh, what a lovely war. It's, it's a fantastic piece. I well, I, I'm not familiar with it, but I'll, I'll look yeah. into it. Uh, yeah, me too. Definitely. So, um, at what point did you get did you get to meet Clive Barker and get involved with the Dog Company? Um, I was doing a production of King Lear, um, and I was playing the fool in it uh, with a Mohican at the time, actually, <laughs> because I was a punk. I was a punk. It was the 80s. And uh, Clive came along to see the production and asked to meet me afterwards. Um, so we kind of we met and we got chatting. And uh, he, he already moved up, obviously, from Liverpool with um, Doug Bradley and uh, Doug's wife, Lynn, um, and started the dog company and also Oliver Parker. And he, he, he said, would you like to join the company when you um, when we have a part for you? So... So I did, and I started off kind of doing some of the technical theatre for uh, some of the, the pieces and then ended up playing Andrew in Paradise Street, um, oh. which you're probably, <laughs> you're probably going to ask me about it. And I have to admit, it was 31 years ago. I've just been looking online to see if, if I can work <laughs> out what the hell Paradise Street was all about. Um, it was a very metaphysical piece yes. uh, based in... Based in, have you have you read it? Yes, 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 we have. Yeah. It's it, based in, in Liverpool, mm -hmm. and um, 
it's strange. <laughs> the, the, there's time travel in it. Queen Victoria, Gloriana, comes back um, to try and get cured for her syphilis, I think. Which is, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's right. she, she comes along with the Duke of Essex. And, uh, the, oh, she's thank you. Yeah, the Duke of Essex. And she's going to speak with Ben Johnson as well at one point. Or has a discussion, yeah. So um, Andrew was – who was Andrew? Andrew was the, uh, the Duke of Essex, I believe, was Doug Bradley. Uh -huh. was, uh, Doug Bradley was playing that, and I was his sidekick in it, um, which was kind of um, – it's, it, it's, it's interesting looking back. There are, there are a lot of patterns um, with, with, with Clive's work, and um, I was Doug's sidekick, which, of course, I ended up being Doug's sidekick in – Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2, and I was dog sidekick in Nightbreed. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, oh, but also, uh, the tattoos. I, um, the, the first book of Blood, he wrote the very first character, the Simon McNeil character. He kind yes. of based it loosely on oh. me. Um, and of course, he, he ended up getting tattooed all over his body. Um, and then I had tattoos in the, in the Nightbreed film. So it's, um, I've been thinking about it all day, and there's all these kind of strange synchronicity whether they're planned or not i'm not yeah. sure um right down to uh, i met i met up with clive a few years ago in liverpool he was visiting his family and we were just walking along the street and he suddenly stopped and he went oh my god we're on paradise street and, and there we were on paradise street <laughs> oh so it's an actual street i had no idea oh yeah ex yeah yeah it really exists it really exists i think it's been flattened in the play hasn't it it's been this guy goes back and kind of look at his youth and finds that the whole area has been completely uh, demolished yes so um yeah uh, well it's 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 funny that you mentioned that uh sidekick um uh series of uh parallels that we can draw from uh andrew and the earl of essex and butterball and pinhead and onaka and lylesburg actually i hadn't thought yeah, about yeah. the nightbreed one so uh, that's interesting uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and I, I get to it continues. I get to play his psychic in um in the fourth right, which is coming up. Oh, yeah. Sure we'll later. <laughs> oh yeah. So it's going on. Um, yeah, I'm doomed to be um by by Doug's side, <laughs> listening to waffle on. <laughs> so so, uh, so Doug Bradley will be playing a, an SS officer as well. Yes, yes. Uh, as usual, he's my boss. Okay. Um, I okay. think it's just because he's it's just because he's taller than me. Obviously, uh, <laughs> it's no more talent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Um, so, and then at one point after the dog company, uh, you got back in touch with Clive to be in Hellraiser, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we 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 toured with the dog company. We for about three years. Um, I went we went up to Edinburgh, toured in Holland, um, played a lot at the Cockpit Theatre in London. Um, and then we we needed to earn a living, and it wasn't really paying. Mm. So we all decided we'd disband and try and kind of go more into commercial theatre. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years later, I didn't see Clive for a couple of years. I just rang him out of the blue to see what he was up to. And he just had a couple of screenplays made into movies, which he wasn't hugely happy with, and had persuaded New Line Cinema to let him direct and write the next one which was Hellraiser and he just said then and there well there's some there's a monster part in it if you'd like it you'd, would, would you like to be in the movie so I kind of bit his hand off really mm, yeah. <laughs> he said that there might be a little bit of makeup involved but, um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good that's an understatement yeah. oh wow yes it was rather yeah <laughs> I think he uh, he gave the same spiel to uh, Doug Bradley. He was like, well, we have a part that's going to be the monster, and we have a moving man. Which one would you prefer? So he went for the monster. And I think he also imagined there would be just a little bit of makeup involved. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, And then he had to but sit for hours. <laughs> it's interesting how the two careers have gone, because, I mean, actually, picking the monster has been great for Doug. I mean, he's done eight or nine, eight, isn't it? I think, um, yes. of the Hellraiser movies and, and has gone on along that line and also all the conventions all over the world. But the moving man obviously was, um, played by Oliver Parker from the dog company and has, who's gone on to become, um, a big director and, and has directed a load of stuff. Um, yes, indeed. Yes. Um, uh, Dorian Gray and, uh, what else? Uh, well, the 
some Trinian's films. Exactly. Um, Johnny English. If oh, yeah. Being Ernest. A yeah, fellow. Big, big hit, Johnny English, uh, across Europe. Yeah, yeah. So. No, he's, he's, he's had a lot of uh, success as well. So either, either role, I think, probably would have worked. <laughs> exactly. So you uh, you were playing Butterball. Um, how harrowing was the experience of wearing that sensory deprivation mask? Could could you see anything <laughs> at all on the soundstage to uh, hit your mark? Do you uh, how was how was that experience? It was pretty horrendous, actually. Um, we uh, the the makeup was about two inches thick, and it completely covered eyes, nose, mouth, ears. Um, but it didn't cover the mouth. I could speak, but then they, they glued the, the, the really nasty dentures on top. So uh, um, I could just about hear. I couldn't see a thing. I was complete, completely blind. Um, couldn't breathe through my nose, so I had to breathe through my mouth. And because of wearing the dentures, that meant that your mouth was constantly filling up with water. So you're <laughs> constantly <laughs> oh my God. sucking in. The <laughs> um, and we were put in it very early in the morning and taken out uh, around eight at night. So, and glued, super glued into it. Um, the very first day on set, they didn't, the, the um, special effects guys obviously knew that we were blind, um, but nobody else on set did. So, we were led onto the set by them, and, and then the, uh, the uh, assistant director came up and said, right, we, we need you to kind of walk over here and do this and do that and the other, and here's your mark. And, and, and Nick, who is Chatter, was the same condition as I was, we were both going, oh, I can't hear. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they couldn't understand what we were saying. And the next thing we knew was action. And we just wandered off in the wrong direction. <laughs> so I think there was uh, some anger at that point that they'd hired these useless actors who <laughs> hadn't got a clue until they realized that actually we were just completely blind. Um, That's funny. Yeah. And so eventually they came to a, a compromise that they'd face us in exactly the right position for the place we needed to get to. And then they had these draft excluders on the floor. We'd shuffle forwards until we could um, hit the draft excluders, then we knew we'd hit the marks. Yeah, oh. it, was, uh, it was pretty miserable. <laughs> yeah, uh, I imagine that, you know, Nicholas Vince would, would be in the same situation because his mask was also, like, covered his whole face. He also had fake dentures on. So, uh, yeah, yeah. That must have been, you know, several hours and hours in the soundstage waiting for, for you to be called. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, Ryan, do you have any questions about Hellraiser? Uh, so was the suit really heavy also? It wasn't too bad, actually. It was um, like a, a fiberglass body, um, which just really just was, was like a yoke that hang oh. over, hung over me. And then the leather kind of costume covered that. Um, and then there was nothing on the bottom at all. We had skirts. Oh, um, okay. Uh, so uh, it was quite cool. Um, it was quite, it was a very comfortable costume to wear. It was just the head was was miserable, and because we were in it fourteen, fifteen hours a day, Jeez. sensory deprivation. I mean, normally on a film set, you're you're sitting around for a long time, but you can talk to other people, you can read the newspaper, you can do the crossword, read a book. With this, we just had to sit with our own thoughts, which was um, yeah, it was wow. a bit. A bit like a nasty psychotherapy. Yeah. yeah. So, so when the when the ceiling collapsed on you, what was that like? <laughs> that was hilarious. That was actually towards the end of the shoot, so everybody was kind of getting used to it. And uh, they told me what was going to happen, and um, I think I didn't have to move then. I just had to stand there, and they said, "Okay, we're going to drop all this polystyrene and full of earth and stuff on top of you, and obviously just react and collapse to the floor." And they tried. <laughs> they did the first take, and I was standing there, and I was still standing there after it. Oh, all the, because I, it was so light, I had no, and I couldn't see. I didn't actually know that they dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my so god! So they, they had to go again and say, "Okay, it's hitting you now." And it was like a kind of, an old silent movie. Oh, okay, wow. it's hitting you now. Fall, react. <laughs> the same when that oh, wow. seemed. Before that, I was stabbing um, Kirsty in the back. I had this big knife. Oh, it's her boyfriend, actually. I think mm -hmm. I was about to stab him. Again, they yes. had to talk me through the fact that where he was and um, when he was walking in front of me so I could raise the knife, because otherwise I just haven't got a clue. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting experience. 
Were there any scenes in in Hellraiser that were left out that w- you know might be that might have been interesting? I don't think so. No, I've, I've had a look. At, I've still got the original scripts, mm-hmm. um, still, with the, still with the blood on actually, which is quite nice. As yeah. far as I, <laughs> as far as I know, um, that all the ones with the Cenobites were in. There was a scene I think in Hellraiser two, which which they um, I think. Um, Pinhead and the female Cenobite were dressed as a doctor and her nurse. Right. And, a nurse. and um, they got them all dressed up, got them to set, and realised that the budget for that particular scene was far bigger than they'd actually got. So they cut the scene. But I think yeah. some stills from that ended up on some of the, um, the DVDs or, or the, the videos. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, they, they definitely became almost uh, a legendary among the Hellraiser fans because everybody was like, well, what about this scene? It's on the VHS cover, but I don't see it in the movie. So everybody uh-huh. started, you know, saying, oh, this is one of the uh, cut scenes from Hellraiser. But then, of course, Doug Bradley, um, in the further editions of the Hellraiser DVDs, he ended up saying that, uh, well, actually, it was never shot because they did put us into costume, but, you know, it, it, it was supposed to be like, special effects intensive so they never really figured out how to make it work so they never really uh-huh. shot it but just uh-huh. the stills photographer ended up taking pictures of it or at least that's what doug bradley said yeah so, I, I have I, somebody contacted me on facebook to ask specifically about that scene um and i contacted doug and i contacted barbie and then i thought well i've, I've got the script so i'll have a look and i have mm-hmm. actually got the theme in my script um and it had all sorts of special effects um in it, which which they just just they just couldn't film, but um, yeah, it's a shame. It's a, it was a shame. It would have been an interesting scene. <laughs> so when you were in the Cricklewood and the soundstage, did did yeah. Clive give you any kind of uh, directions uh, regarding who Butterball might have been, or you know what what how his character would behave? Did he give you any kind of like uh, directions towards how he would act, or uh, did he leave that up to you? He, I think his guidance were that we were high priests of hell. Um, that, that there wasn't a, if there wasn't a great deal, um, the kind of the makeup spoke for themselves, really. We were into pleasure from pain. Um, we definitely had that kind of religious sense of authority about us. Um, I don't remember much more, to be honest. I probably mm-hmm. couldn't. Hear, I probably couldn't hear him if, if he was telling me. <laughs> well, well the, the the suits were just fascinating pieces yeah. of uh, of work. I, I mean, they were designed uh, by Jane Walgus, if I'm that's correct. Right, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So they were supposed to be very uh, priest-like. And actually, uh, you were talking about the uh, the suits a while ago, and I actually remember seeing an eBay auction where the original suits from uh, Hellbound were found in a Pinewood um, storage. And they were put uh-huh. on on auction, and they yes. actually were sold to a Hellraiser collector, uh, which uh-huh. actually I, I know, and they went for like a thousand pounds or something like that. Uh-huh. Um, wow! And I think it was like a Pinhead, a Chatterer, and uh, and Butterballs, but they yeah. were in very bad condition, and they were actually made of leather. Yeah, that's right. The the I mean, like I say, the the, the stomach, the kind of the, the flesh bit that you can see was made out of fiberglass with um with latex on it. But the actual the, the costume was yeah, made out of leather, um which was then oiled down to give it a nice sheen. Um they also had um um a jeweler who worked on the film who did I, I had a tool belt with loads of um instruments of torture and they were Beautifully made, just beautifully made by this jeweler. He also was responsible for the the boxes, the uh, oh. the configuration boxes. It, that was his work. Um, but it was a great shame. He, he did some amazing work, and you you kind of see it briefly. But uh, he also did the jewelry that went through the female Cenobite's cheeks into her neck. Oh. What was um, that uh, jeweler named Simon Sacy? It might well have been <laughs> because uh, because I got in touch with uh, uh, someone who worked with. Uh, Bob Keen, and she worked with Simon Sacy and his brother. And Simon Sacy is credited as the man who came up with the uh, Lament configuration box. So yeah, uh, it, it must have been. That, it must have been the same person. Then yeah, yeah. Okay, we we had some interesting, interesting times at Cricketwood. Actually, they they uh, they had a duck pond outside the production studio, 
which had f loads of ducks in it. Um, and <laughs> they the, they were having trouble on the odd take with this quacking that kept happening on quiet scenes. <laughs> and uh, one day we came we came back in and mysteriously all the ducks had disappeared from the duck pond overnight. <laughs> <laughs> have they been taken to hell <laughs> <laughs> I think we had uh, 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 duck pancakes for a few days on set oh. <laughs> duck razor <laughs> we'll tear your ducks apart <laughs> your quacks oh, will be legendary even in hell <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh, that's fantastic uh, well, Ryan, do you have any more questions about Hellraiser? Uh, yeah, and just one more. I mean, this is kind of uh, this is more broad. But have you been following the Hellraiser comic book that uh, that Clive and Chris Monfett started? I haven't. I haven't seen them. No, I, I have got some very old comic books, but they were kind of nineteen eighties. Oh yeah, my time. Well, these ones um, they brought the uh, they brought the original uh, the original group of Cenobites back uh, rather than just Pinhead and you know plus three or whatever uh-huh which was pretty nice oh i'll have to get hold of them yes no, they, they actually um uh, they actually have replaced uh, pinhead with kirsty kirsty has become the new pinhead in the comics <laughs> so yes <laughs> well you see there's another of clive's um themes the the, the, the strong woman uh yes. so many so much of what he writes the 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 female lead is the really the strongest character in the piece yeah in yeah. fact at, at the end of hellbound uh claire higgins was supposed to uh become the new villain of the the franchise uh julia she was supposed to come up of the pillar and become the uh, new a villain who would take souls to hell to leviathan i think but then claire uh -huh. higgins was not interested in doing any more sequels so uh at least that's what uh what i've, I've read in interviews so I, I did a show with Claire last year in the States. Uh, oh, yeah? she, is, she is wild. <laughs> oh, really? We had such a fantastic time. Yeah, yeah. If you get a chance to go to a convention where Claire's there, go, because she's just great fun. Great fun. All right. So, okay. um, so then, any more questions about Hellraiser, no, Brian? No, no. That's, that's all I can think of. All right. So uh, moving on to Nightbreed. Um, of course, Nightbreed is a movie which suffered greatly from outside interference uh, when it came to the final cut, but uh, hopefully we'll get to see it partially restored soon. In this in this film, you play Onaka. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a uh, he's a, a a member of the Nightbreed, and he has these tattoos that you already mentioned and piercings and a little dog. Any any funny stories about this dog? Yeah, the dog's name was Frank. Strangely enough. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> you see, there's such synchronicity in Clive's work, but his actual name was Frank. Uh, yeah, we, uh, I had, uh, I had, I spent a lot of time trying to bond with the dog. I love dogs, just love dogs, but I didn't get on with this one particularly oh. well. It just didn't want to know me. Um, so yeah, I took it for walks, played with it, offset, did everything I could to get to know with it. And uh, then we have one take, one scene where they wanted the dog to. It was a huge scene on the uh, huge stage on the pine woods. Um, James Bond set uh, stage and they wanted this dog to run across the set and up these stairs and jump into my arms and would it do it oh I, I, I had sausages in my hands I had the uh, <laughs> the owner of the dog kind of hidden behind me calling its name they ended up putting marmite on my legs <laughs> to get it to come up. that's, that's uh, horrible I think we did 60 takes oh but, Everybody was getting crosser and crosser, more frustrated. They never got the chance in the end. Eventually, they gave up and they had to do it in sections. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, he, you just walk out and you have the dog in your arms, right? In the in in the final yeah. cut of the movie. I think the thing there's a scene you see it running and then you see me picking it up. But oh, that was supposed okay. to be, it was supposed to be all one shot, but uh, they never managed to get it. Sadly. Uh. Yeah, it was uh, it was it was great fun for me having done two Hellraisers, the following year to go into Nightbreed and not have any makeup at all, to to meet uh, as an awful lot of the crew who'd worked on the Hellraisers to actually meet them properly and to be able to talk to them and and get to know them, um, to see 
the incredible makeups that were coming out of image animation i think there were more makeups on that film i think it was in the guinness book of records more different makeups in that film than any other film that's ever been made since um they they were going potty in the uh, in the prosthetics department trying to come up with new ideas every day for and, and funny enough, a lot of the actors were the same actors. They would just go in and they wouldn't know what character they were going to be. Oh. So they were oh. doubling up or tripling up, but with just different makeups on. Oh, that's just amazing. Yeah, uh, there's, of course, uh, if anybody out there listening to this is a Hellraiser fan and Nightbreed fan, I'm sure they have uh, the Nightbreed Chronicles. It's a wonderful book that yeah. has uh, uh, high quality uh, photography done of all the Nightbreed that were in the movie. Well, not all, not all, but you know most of them. Of them. Yeah. And it's just amazing the amount of work they did on some of the breed who ended up being in just you know the background shots or just showed up on camera for one or two seconds or minutes. And it so, has the, and, the backstory for each one of them. Yeah, absolutely. There was I, I had a scene with that wonderful character who had his head. He was a big, um, overweight chap, and he had his head in the middle of his stomach. Oh yeah. Um. I had a scene with him. It was just incredible, that makeup with uh, loads of um, animatronics for his hands. But in the film, you know, I run past him. That's all you really see of the guy. It's, yeah, uh, yeah that's, that's, that's actually really sad that all, all, those, um, all that effort sometimes was just for a, a couple of seconds of, um, of, of camera time. So, uh, yeah. But still, I, I'm, I'm amazed that they had like over 100 different makeups for, for Nightbreed. And... Uh, and the Nightbreed Chronicles has these fascinating little backstories for it. And the one for oh. Onaka was that um, your character was born tattooed by angels who were scared that God would find out about their handiwork and made him so sensitive to light that he couldn't bear to be out in the, in the sun. So, uh, which explains uh, your character's demise. Um, isn't, that a Onaka, beautiful de- isn't that a beautiful yeah. description? It's just yes. lovely. It's it's just a wonderful little backstory that Clive um, wrote for the the book. Was any uh, of this discussed before the movie, or as you were talking to Clive about your character, or um, was this just something that they made for the book? That's an interesting one. I don't remember if I'm honest. I think a lot of it was was brought up for the book. Um, I knew that obviously I knew I was sensitive to sunlight. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I knew I was Doug Bradley's sidekick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember we, we, I did a scene with Doug. We, uh, I'm much smaller than Doug. Um, so, they want, again, they wanted this long tracking shot of, me, of him and I talking. And <laughs> he, uh, they had to put this little row of boxes for me. So, uh, he, was, he, he would walk along and I would be walking along on these boxes trying to feel with my feet so I didn't fall off them so that we were the same height so that they could kind of get the two shot together. Your character Onaka, uh, in regards to his backstory, he also had a recurring nightmare that one day these angels would return to tattoo him again, but this time they would tattoo him inside as well as out. So <laughs> there was kind of a that, sinister edge to Onaka. And that completely ties up with um, Simon McNeil in The Book oh, of Bloods. Yeah. Completely ties up. Uh, you oh, see, yeah. Clive yeah, is a genius. I... He's a genius <laughs> on so many different levels. So much of his stuff is metaphysical that, you know, you can read it on loads of different levels. But also, he's obviously got all these things tying up his, in his head as well. It's just so clever. <laughs> yeah, no, amazing. He's amazing. <laughs> were there any scenes in, in uh, Nightbreed that uh, that you were kind of disappointed that didn't make it into the movie? Any Any Onaka scenes? No, uh, Clive actually said to me at the preview that um, every scene we filmed, he was really pleased that every scene we filmed it made it into the movie. Ah, okay. Um, which was great. My, my only regret of the, of the Nightbreed film was um, in, the, in the sequel, because obviously I exploded in the first film, he, uh, he planned for me to come back as my twin sister. Um, oh, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I was really looking forward, and I was going to have the most beautiful, perfect pair of um, prosthetic tits, because obviously he was topless, or she would be topless, uh, and I was just thinking this was going to be really interesting to play. Um, oh, sweet heavens. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, that is fantastic. Next week, they're going to have a showing of what uh, what Mark Miller is calling the Cabal Cut, 
of Nightbreed right. at the Mad Monster Party in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. And this is supposed to be three hours long. I've seen it. Oh, you have? Yeah. They they had, last year or the year before, they had like a rough cut version. Yes. Would that be, the, that be the same one? It, uh, no. This one is, uh, has been partially restored by uh, Seraphim Films. Uh, right. And they've actually hired – they actually brought in um, the original director of photography, Robin Vigen. And, <gasps> no uh, way. How fantastic. Yes. yes, they brought him back, and they used uh, two VHS work prints and the theatrical cut, and they've okay. been uh, working on it. I I'm assuming that the director of photography came in to do some color correction or something. And uh -huh. they also brought in Doug to redub back his lines as Lylesburg because they had been dubbed over. Uh -huh. So, uh, so, so uh, they, they've been actually uh, doing a good job for that. And there's a YouTube oh. video out there of Doug uh, re-recording his lines. How fantastic. That's brilliant. You know, I, I, I talked to Clive because I've been doing a few conventions for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I, see, I try to see Clive every year. And about four or five years ago, I was saying to him, you know, there's more of an interest. People are having more of an interest in Nightbreed. It seems to be having a bit of a resurrection. And he really picked up on it and said, oh, well, that's, that's interesting. Because obviously he, he invested so much of himself into that film. Um, and I know he always wanted to, to do a kind of director's cut version of it. Um, oh, that will be amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's I, I'm gonna it's going to be fantastic. I'll be flying out there to see it next weekend. You'll have to let me know what it's like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely I will. Ryan's the lucky one. He'll be... <laughs> our eyes and ears in the Mad, Mad Monster Party. So um, that, that's going to be fantastic. I'm really uh, expecting that this cut will, will ever get a uh, proper uh, edition. I mean, I, I know at one point that uh, Phil and Sarah from Revelations, um, ClydeBarker.info, they were working on uh, trying to get in touch with the head of Morgan Creek to see if they could convince him to release uh, this new cut, even if it was – with a, a package like a book about the production of Nightbreed because they were not really interested in investing any money to even justify transferring it to uh, HD or Blu-ray. So uh -huh. there's been a campaign going on, you know, that well, we're trying they, to get, yeah, in, we're in trying Europe, to get them to publish it. And in Europe, right, there's not even a DVD. No, that's no. right. I've, I've got a, I've got an American, um, DVD version, but um, because I've upgraded all my systems now, it won't play, and I can't hack them to uh, oh, to get it. To play. <laughs> it's very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I have the same Region One uh, version, but uh, you know, uh, actually, I I, I kind of decrypted the DVD and burn it again as Region Three. So <laughs> I can <laughs> I can I can get back on you on that technical uh, way of uh, getting your DVD to work again. It's really simple. <laughs> You might say that I couldn't possibly comment. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, please. <laughs> so, um, so okay. So the, Nightbreed was in 1990, and then we see you back again in the movies, at least in 2009 for the Book of Blood. Yeah, yeah. But in quite between a long, that, quite a long gap. <laughs> oh, well, did that, we want to talk about Hellraiser two a little bit also? I would have loved to have played. I mean, we didn't even get Doug and uh, uh, Nick and I didn't even get to play ourselves after we transformed back into human beings. That's what I'd he, heard he, that it would just took too much time. Would have taken too much time to get in and out of costumes. No, it was. They wanted him to be a little boy, and obviously he wasn't. And they thought um, Butterball transforming into me would just be um, stretching credulity too far because I, you know, I was twenty three or twenty four at the time. So you know, I looked like a little boy. It just wouldn't have worked. Um, so they they got this guy that looked similar to Butterball, and they he he was the one they that transformed into. Yeah, <laughs> I know that at least Nicholas Vince came up with a little backstory that was published about um, his his actual uh, char human character before he became uh, Chatterer. He was supposed to be a uh -huh. comedian. Uh, it was a story called Look See, and uh, yeah, it's a funny story. It's out there. It's been published. Hmm. So yeah, I mean, I'll be honest. Uh, I was. I had I was like ten years old when Hellraiser came out, so uh, when 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 Hellbound came out, I was like twelve. So I only got uh -huh. to see those in the late eighties, early nineties, and right. uh, for a long time, I I thought that the fat guy uh, when Shenard kills Butterball was the actual character that played uh, Butterball, 
It was oh, only yeah, later see. after I'd seen Nightbreed that I, I I saw Simon Banford and then Simon Banford in the credits. And I was like, oh, okay, this is the same guy who did Butterball. Oh, okay. So that was a surprise for me. That, yeah, you know, that thing, uh, it, because Butterball had this great big wound in his stomach, um, they wanted to make it really deep so I could get my whole hand in and look like I was playing with my innards. Um, mm-hmm. So they needed somebody skinny to fit inside this big costume um, to be able to create that image. Um, and actually, that was one of the scenes that was eventually cut because <laughs> the censors at the time drew their line, drew the line at that point. I think they drew the line at that and they drew the line. There were some sex scenes as well, which they said was just going too far. And this is Hellraiser um, 1, correct? Hellraiser 1, yeah, yeah right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, the, 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 the sex scenes between Frank and Julia where they, they would not allow more than two consecutive thrusts of the buttocks. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they had to cut to flowers or something, and then cut back to the sex scene, then cut back again to something, and then like back. the nail in the in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, ah, the ages. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, at, at one point, um, you were involved with a healthy eating show, weren't you? Yeah, I still am. I I created. A, yeah, I did a lot of theatre after Nightbreed. Um, toured in the UK for a lot uh, it shows uh, in the West End and all over the place really um, and then about six years ago I decided that I wanted to do something that would put back something into the community so I created um, a healthy eating children's show which uh, occasionally roll out um, all over the UK and uh, yeah it's, it's been very successful that's wonderful. But I have to keep, right. I have to keep, because it's a kids' show. I have to keep it very much apart from from the horror stuff. It's a bit like going <laughs> to Jekyll and Mr Hyde, you know. So the uh, you're saying that the chubbiest Cenobite actually is very concerned about proper eating. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and actually, I noticed that uh, in Hellraiser, uh, all the other Cenobites got sent home, but Butterball kind of got left there in the house. Yeah, that's right. He did, didn't he? Did, did yeah. he have to walk think, home? <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a kind of yellowish glow, and I, when the oh, others okay. all got sent back, there was a they had this yellow effect put over them. I think there was a yellow glow in the distance, and I think that was supposed to be. I think oh, there was probably okay. too much dust and chaos for them to actually be able to do that to me in special effects afterwards. But Ryan, if he walked that, home, uh, yeah, if, if he walked that, home, he probably didn't make it. You know? <laughs> I think he wrote a. Uh, he rode the Chatter Beast home, the one oh, from Hellraiser 4. Yeah. He's, he's so. probably still wandering around Cricklewood somewhere. Trying to find... <laughs> Haunting the, the Phantom of Cricklewood. Yeah. That's, he's he, eats all the scraps. Actually... he eats all the scraps from the uh, um, uh, cafeteria. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's him and the ducks. They're just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that duck story is just amazing. <laughs> Okay, so um, and then you were also in the Little Shop of Horrors, the the UK tour, right? Yeah, I, I did the first UK. I went to see it actually with uh, Ellen Green in the West End, and thought mm-hmm. she was just sensational. I don't know if you were lucky enough to see her live, but she was is brilliant. Um, and thought I really want to do this, and then um, they had I had five auditions for the the first tour of it in the UK, and uh, and got the part. So yeah, we toured for six months. Um, here in here in England, and uh, it was great fun. It was great fun. We we had uh, the West End plants, which were brilliant. Um, and then I was lucky enough to do it again uh, a couple of years later for um, Bill Kenwright um, in Hornchurch here in England, and they they had the most amazing plant. They had a hydraulic Audrey two at the end, which oh. um, when it ate us, it it went kind of fifteen feet up into the air and wow. chewed us. We had slide we had to come down the back of it and then it right at the end it went way over the audience over the first kind of five or six rows and looked down at them and then squirted co2 gas through its nostrils onto them <laughs> it was uh, it was awesome it was uh, great sounds yeah. pretty That's cool need. yeah yeah good, good times yeah i did a lot of musical theater i did um the very first tour of jesus christ superstar which really is going back some, some way now it's Imagine, I was Simon Zelotes in that. Uh, oh, tons, tons and tons and tons. Huh. 
That's fantastic. All right, Ryan, would you like to talk about the Book of Blood? How did you end up? Uh, how did you end up becoming a part of that that movie? Um, I was just trawling the uh, the internet and by accident came across some, um, an article uh, that they were filming the Book of Blood, and I hadn't heard anything about it. And so I fired off some uh, emails to the casting director and the director saying, um, well, actually, this, this, this piece was written about me. This story was written about me all those years ago. Um, is, is there a part in it that I can have? And as usual, I got no reply whatsoever. So the next day, I sent an email off to Clive. And the following morning, I had an email back from the casting director saying, of course, we've got a part for you. <laughs> <laughs> in it. So it's not a, not a big part. Um, right. um, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's how I ended up playing the uh, Derek, the removals man in, uh, in in the Book of Bloods, and went up to uh, was filmed in Edinburgh. But you know, I yeah. have to say that uh, I really enjoy that adaptation. I, I don't, I you know, I just want to say it was great to see you back in a movie based on a Clive Barker story, and uh, with Doug Bradley on board as well. He, he yep. was playing that um, that character that was a bit like Alistair Crowley or something. And Very I similar. think it was one of the one of the best Barker story adaptations in the last few years. So yeah, it was interesting. You know it was kind of love story. Um, it had a, very much a kind of a, a feeling of a love story about it, um, more than a horror film. I think more than a horror story. Um, it was lovely working with uh, with Jonas Armstrong, um, who obviously we'd seen over here in the Robin Hood um, mm. TV series. I don't know if you got that where you are. No. Uh, um, and, no. Uh, and John Harrison as well from the Dune miniseries. Uh, yeah. Direct. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was, uh, I was terrified actually because I hadn't done a movie for a decade, a decade and a half. Um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was very, very nervous. I was actually vomiting the night before. I was oh, so geez. terrified. <laughs> Which, in retrospect, is completely crazy. But so uh, yeah. I learned a lot from doing that, and now, and now, thankfully, I've got a couple more yeah. uh, movies coming up, so I'm feeling a little bit more. I've learned a lot from the Book of Blood, so uh, it's reminded me uh, where I should be going, what I should be looking at. I'm, I'm really looking forward to these next two. So, Dead of Dead of the Night. Uh, what can you tell us about that? What is it about? Dead of the Night. We're filming next month in April in Cardiff. Um, I think 85% of the film has now been shot. Oh. Um, it has Tony Todd, uh, the Candyman, mm-hmm. uh, is playing a part in it. It's um, it's about a group of television ghost hunters who go to investigate uh, an infamous haunted house called Jericho Manor. And they soon realise it, it's not just the ghosts that are going to give them problems. And, uh, and one by one, as they get slaughtered, they have to try and discover who or what is killing them. And uh, it's a great script. I, I was only sent the script three weeks ago and thought, this is brilliant. This is so clever. Um, and because it's a TV um, ghost hunting company, it, it's shown from the perspective of the police looking back on the footage oh, that they've okay. shot. As, like, like, as oh. they, like Blair Witch so, Project or Cloverfield kind of? Like yeah. a lost footage um, movie? Yeah. Yeah. Or found yeah, footage. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of a mix between paranormal activity and Halloween, but with some Blair Witch and some... Um, it reminded me a bit of um, A Woman in Black as well. I don't know if you've seen that yet. Uh, a lot of jump, jump moments. Not yet, oh, but I, think, I plan to. Yeah. I play a, a police um, lab technician called Gary... Um, which is slightly comedy, <laughs> but I can't really say much more than that. Okay. Hopefully, not too much comedy. I, I, I'm a great believer that in in something like a horror film, comedy should come from the truth rather than being imposed mm-hmm. upon it. Oh yeah. So, well, when can um, we expect to see it coming out? I believe, um, as I say, that the filming next month in Cardiff is the last of the filming, and they're hoping to have it out by Halloween. So, oh, wonderful. Yeah, later this year. No, I was just saying, I'm actually looking at the IMDb page right now, 
And there might be a big spoiler in the page because there's a character billed as killer. So we are we get to know which actor is going to play the killer in the IMDb page. So, yeah, I would like to warn the people, uh, if you don't want any spoilers, don't look at the actor's name. <laughs> yeah, um, I think uh, you might say that. I couldn't possibly comment, but I think that's there deliberately. Oh, OK. OK. I think it's a red herring. All right. Well, that, that's right. a little better then. Yeah. Well, obviously, I know the I know how they die. <laughs> I'm picking my words carefully now. Okay. I know I know how they all die, but obviously, I can't say. <laughs> Very well. <laughs> and then Fourth Reich is that going to be coming after uh, Dead of Night? Dead of Yeah. Night? The fourth, the Fourth Reich I was offered a couple of years ago, and um, I know they're still having troubles with the funding. Um, the Fourth Reich is a Second World War movie. Um, basically, uh, there's a group, uh, British Third Infantry Division. They're kind of advancing through France and through Europe. And as they do, they're, they're uncovering these very strange events. And it, it turns out a team of Nazi doctors and scientists have been experimenting and have accidentally created zombies and uh, yeah um, I've got a lovely scene with Tom Savini and Doug Bradley again playing Doug Bradley's psychic <laughs> um, <laughs> where we're kind of shoveling corpses onto a, onto a funeral pyre um, and you play uh, SS Unterscharfuhrer Kraus right? yeah that's right yeah we're all going to be speaking German the three of us so that's going to be <laughs> ich bin ein Schauspieler und ich spreche nur ein bisschen Deutsch it's, uh, I did a convention in Germany recently, and they were they were very complimentary. They said I actually sounded, I speak German like a German. So oh, good. That's good. I can <laughs> only know, uh, understand from what you said that I am an actor. I didn't get the rest. Yeah, I'm an actor, and I speak only a little German. Yeah. Oh. I, I, I know very little. Feel Spaß, have fun. Um, <laughs> obviously, how to order beer. <laughs> And uh, it's also Sean Pertwee is going to be in this movie? Yeah, that's right. Um, I've, I've not met Sean, so I'm looking forward to, to, to working with him. It, it's, oh, yeah. it's an exciting project. Both of them actually are, are looking like they're going to be great fun to work on. We're supposed to be filming the fourth Reich in um, Estonia, uh, I believe. Oh. And then so. uh, with Tom Savini being in the cast, do, do they also have him set up for practical special effects? Not as far as I know. No, I asked that. As far as I know, he's just in it as for 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 the um, for the acting. Um, whether he'll be advising, I don't know. So we'll we'll be sure to add links to this movie's website and oh, a yeah. trailer after the interview on the podcast website. So our listeners, yeah. please make sure to check it out. Yeah, and and the Dead of the Night as well would be great. The Night yeah, Special yeah. N I T E. Yeah, that would be great. Right, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, Dead of the Night. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, that's the name, not Dead of Night. Because that, that, there's another movie with that name. So, yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for, for, uh, for agreeing to do this. It means a lot no to problem. us. No problem. No, yeah. no doubt we'll bump into each other at a convention sooner or later. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, come on by. Yeah, it was, a, it was a pleasure to have you as a guest of the Clive Barker Podcast. And please keep us informed of all your future product, projects, uh, whether through Twitter or Facebook. Sure, I will do. Yeah, I will, definitely. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thanks very much, guys. All right, thank you. Thank you, and uh, it was a pleasure. Okay. I look, forward, I look forward to listening to it. All right. Thank you for listening to the Clive Barker Podcast, Episode 6 with Simon Bamford. You can find us on the web at www.cliveparkercast.com on iTunes. Our podcast is called The Clive Barker Podcast. Or Twitter, we're at BarkerCast. Or you can find us on Facebook as well. Your quacks oh, will be legendary even in hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Hello, this is Ryan again. In the original airing of this episode, we had the song March of the Sinister Ducks. Uh, by Translucia Baboon. Uh, in order to pre to um, honor the rights holders and respect the rights holders, we've removed it from this episode. I recommend you find March of the Sinister Ducks by Translucia Baboon and give it a listen. Thanks for understanding and this podcast having no beginning 
will have no end.